All right, friends, and uh, welcome to uh, what our first session with a friend and guest who is able to share uh, something with us when it comes to looking at authority and scripture, branching on our Revelation text that we looked at and the Revelation um, day that we looked at yesterday. So we have joining us a um, friend and professor of public theology at Southeastern, uh, also teaching pastor at um, Sanctuary Church in Tulsa, a bunch of different things that he always has going on. Loves, I love looking at his art and stuff as well. This is uh, Dr. Chris Green, and he's joining us. Um, and he's written a couple books, but the one that's probably most pertinent to our conversation today is uh, sanctifying interpretation and there's a second draft of it or second version of it coming out next week so exciting times um as we go about yeah, all everyone, this stuff. everyone's just waiting with bated breath for that i know i, I bet the pre-orders are uh oh yeah just in the dozens i doubt it's even that high actually in the single digits well yeah i've got nothing it, it's probably <laughs> true no i'm kidding <laughs> No, oh, it is. It is true. That's how this works. I just tell myself that that's how it works for like 99% of us. So it's okay. Yeah. There's a book there to be gleaned. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so Chris, um, obviously a lot of your work has centered around um, interpreting scripture in ways that create more faithful people. Um, can you tell us a bit of the background Um for your faith background of how you came to read the Bible in ways that um, are meant to form people in that direction and how you describe what faithfulness looks like. Well, I'll start with the last part of your question first. I think faithfulness has to look like Jesus. I mean, I think that's what we're, for Christians, mm. we, we feel called to become, to, to share in his image, to have his character, to live with the same spirit he lived with, to live with the same grace he lived with. So I think faithfulness is, is a way of naming the Christ-like life. And I've come to believe that the reading of Scripture should lead us toward that, and any reading of Scripture that doesn't lead us toward that you know, isn't, isn't a faithful one, isn't a good reading of Scripture. Of course, that still leaves all kinds of questions open, right, in terms of who gets to say what does and doesn't lead us to look like Jesus, who gets to say what is and isn't like Jesus. I mean, I, I think there are still all kinds of questions left unanswered by that. But I am committed to those convictions, right, that we are called to be like Jesus, and reading Scripture is meant to make us more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you uh, look at the background that has framed that for you, how did you come to um, come to that place where um, obviously we're emphasizing who Jesus is in our lives, but, yeah. um, and, and those questions you asked after, but what caused you to come to that place? Well, part of the, and this, this is the ambiguity in what I'm saying for sure in that, I mean, I was raised in very conservative fundamentalist, Pentecostal church, there was a lot of talk about the Bible. And I mean, I, King James was the only version we were allowed to right, read. Right. I mean, it was a King James only church, but there was a lot of emphasis on the Bible and there was a lot of talk about Jesus, but there was never really any sense that the two were related intimately. And even though I think that if I if I went back to those churches now and said to them, you know, I think we're called to be like Jesus, and I think we are meant to read the Bible in ways that make us more like Jesus, I think they would agree. But I don't think that's what was actually happening in those churches, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, you know, that's there's always this like gap, this this kind of uh, fissure between our theories about these things and how they actually work in practice. And I th I think that a lot of what I've come to believe about scripture is shaped in reaction to the abuses that I saw in those churches growing up, the fundamentalism and, and above and beyond the fundamentalism, right? So I, I think fundamentalism is one thing. And I think that's an intellectual failure. I think fundamentalism is a, is a failure of intellectual honesty and, 
theological integrity. But not all fundamentalists are, are hateful people. I happen to have the perfect storm of fundamentalist people who were also terrible people. <laughs> sure, and, sure. And that, yeah. that is a, a remarkable, not all of them, of course, but many. It was, it was just a kind of a toxic community for reasons that, you know, we don't need to get into. But anyway, I, I think that they managed to have a lot of focus on the Bible but not really any concern at all for being like Jesus in terms of grace and forgiveness and mercy and patience. Um, they were really interested in his condemnation of the Pharisees. But other than that, you know, there wasn't much Christ-likeness that was coming from their reading of Scripture. So I'm, I guess I'm endlessly fascinated in a very personal way with whether or not we're becoming like Jesus, what we think that means, mm. how we how we get there, and and how easily deceived we can be into thinking that we're more like Jesus than we are. Yeah, I'm in so many ways. Um, I can think of places in my tradition and my family's tradition, um, in the the faith that was handed to us, that also resonates um, with certain privileging of texts over other parts yeah. to create a kind of person. Um, That's right. That's and right. even in the way that we've used the language of, I, I think we've used these terms interchangeably at times. And, uh, you know, you have the idea of Bible, scripture, text, gospel, all these words, the word of God was the big one for us. Sure. Um, okay. We use them all kind of interchangeably in your mind. Are they all the exact same thing or is there nuance within uh, how we describe these things. Well, I mean, I think in terms of descriptively, if speaking descriptively, yes, I think they work more or less interchangeably for most people. But I think if we were to to try to be a little more careful, we might want to make a distinction. So Joel Green, who teaches at Fuller, has made a distinction between the Bible and Scripture. I think it's original to him. I know I read it first in him in which he talks about the Bible is simply the texts, the, the historical documents, right? And you could study the Bible, he says, even if you had no faith at all. Like if you were not a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, you, you could study the Bible just as a historian or as a literary critic or a cultural critic, you know, whatever, whatever your discipline might be. But he says scripture is, is something else altogether. It's the same texts, but the texts have a different reality for you because you you engage them in faith. You engage them conv convinced that God is speaking in them so that they are those texts are somehow the word of God. And I think that's a pretty helpful distinction, right, between between the Bible and scripture. Again, I don't think that's how the common person in my circles is using the terms, but I think it's a helpful it's it is a helpful way to kind of illuminate some differences. Yeah, and certainly I think one of the things that stand out when we look at how that works is um, it, I think it pushes back on individualism uh, when it comes to reading um, and it's pushing towards like uh, how is the tradition, how is a community reading these texts and how's that community then forming people into a certain kind of way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about positionality? for a community as they read the text? Well, this, this is the hard, a hard part of this conversation in that I think, you know, to, to truly be analytical here, I mean, there, there are some truisms, you know, that people can throw around about, you know, for, for a while in Pentecostal academic circles where, you know, where I often move, there was a lot of talk about the authority of the community. So, a work like Ken Archer's Pentecostal hermeneutics book in which he, he suggests that the community should have a kind of authority over the individual reader. The problem with that, and, and I think there's wisdom in what he's saying for sure, the problem with that is, again, whose community, which community you have in mind, and in what way do they exercise that authority, right? Do they exercise that authority through a figure who represents them? Do they ep exercise that authority through some kind of de facto consensus? I mean, what, what does that authority actually look like? So these, this problem of whose authority is the, is the final authority or whose reading is the authoritative one is a really, it's a fraught 
question for sure. And I, I do think that we should be afraid of like individualistic readings, you know, readings that are so idiosyncratic that nobody else shares them, right? I mean, that, that is, that's something that I think should startle us. But I also think we have to be wary of communitarian readings that keep us from seeing what's actually in the text, right? So here, here's an example of what I mean. Like the churches I grew up in, as I said, were, you know, King James only fundamentalist types. And for them, everything in the Bible was about what they would call personal holiness. It was about, and, and that for them essentially came down to drinking, smoking, and the clothes you wear for the most part. I mean, it really did reduce to something that simplistic. And they read the Bible through that lens. So because they read the Bible through that lens, Deuteronomy 22.5, which in the King James says something like, it is an abomination for a man to wear what pertains to a woman and a woman to wear what pertains to a man. That text was central for them. Like somehow that text had the kind of authority, which is to your point earlier about how communities kind of fixate on texts within the canon, and, and elevate their authority over other texts, e even unintentionally or unconsciously. So that's what had happened with this text, right? It, it had a kind of authority, and it, and it had a kind of unquestioned authority. No one stopped to ask, well, what do we actually mean by women's apparel and men's apparel? We all kind of assumed we knew. And the reason we could assume we knew is that nobody in the community questioned it, right? The community had come to this agreement about what the text meant. And therefore, there was no room for questioning what the text meant. If you did question it, you were out of the community, right? Like that was a way in which the community kind of controlled the readings. And so I, I think we should be wary of readings that don't allow for differences, right? So, for, so I, I think we're right to be wary of, of, of individualistic readings, but I also think we should be wary of communitarian readings that are kind of closed worlds, right? Worlds in which no other possibilities are, are allowed. And, and I think, oddly enough, that, that that's, that's the greater danger for most of us. I think individualistic readings are, are pretty rare, really. I mean, we like to think we're reading individualistically, but usually we're just parroting somebody else's idea. Um, right. And I think one thing that you're keying in on there is the difference between um, we, we can read individ individualistically in one way or communally in a uniform way yes. without ever striking on the beauty of diversity that is present right. in the mm -hmm. unity of God. And so we replace unity with uniformity. <laughs> and in doing that, we've actually just amplified an individual reading that just belongs to a community. Um and so That's pressing right. in on that whole idea is, you know, also speaking to the type of communities we form um, yeah. and pressing in on all that. Com yeah, completely agree. And I mean, I think what I would hope for, you know, and, and again, there's another qualification I want to put on this in terms of, I think that, so, you know, 15, I guess, 20 years ago, 20 years ago now, yeah. Uh, my wife and I were part of a church plant, part of leading a church plant, and we I was teaching at the time, and most of the people involved in the church plant were either teaching at a college or attending college. And we had Wednesday night small groups that were focused on Bible study, essentially. And I, as a pastor, I realized very quickly that that was counterproductive for us. And it was counterproductive for us because instead of like, caring for each other or praying together or just listening to each other, we were kind of carrying on an academic enterprise, right, of reading the Bible, try, trying to outdo each other, essentially, in clever readings of Scripture. And I think that that's, that's like a third complication to what we're talking about here, right? So if you've got kind of individualistic readings and then you've got these kind of formulaic um, uniform communal readings, you also have, I think, communities where the reading of the Bible 
becomes about something else, right? It seems to be about the study of scripture, but in fact, it's about asserting your own creativity or your own knowledge or your own giftedness. And so I, I think I think we can go wrong in a lot of different ways here, right? I mean, that's the point, is, is that there are a lot of different ways to get this wrong. And But I, I think you've already stated, I mean, the goal should be, right, community, reading in community and for the sake of one another in ways that allow that kind of God-given diversity to, to flourish. And I, I think that's, that's what we should aspire to, I think. And, and one more note that um, I know I've heard you talk about before when you, uh, when you touched on Deuteronomy being one of the primary texts is um, how, how did you then read the parable of the prodigal son when they put a ring, right? <laughs> right. Can, can you talk about that piece? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, there was this enormous scandal in our churches because the, you know, part of these holiness codes, these purity codes meant you could not wear jewelry. And there was some debate about what that did and didn't include, but everyone agreed it, it meant rings. No one could wear rings of any kind, even wedding bands. So, I mean, that, that seemed obvious to them that the Bible was forbidding that. But then you have the story of the prodigal son, right, in which we're told that the prodigal comes home and the father puts the ring on his hand, right? And again, for most people, they, they would never bat an eye, right, at that detail in the story. But in my churches, it was a serious concern. And so finally, someone broke the code and figured out the way to, to speak to that was to say, and one of the ways that, that preachers usually did it is just to say, this is a parable. It's not literal. Like we shouldn't think we can wear rings just because right. this person in the parable did. So that's right. the way they got around it mostly is, is a, some kind of appeal to genre. But this, this guy, he, he, it was at a camp meeting service and he decided to really take it to the next level and argued that in Greek, which, you know, I now realize you know, what he meant was someone had told him in the Strong's Concordance, it says this. But regardless, he said in the Greek, it means that the ring was put in his hand, not on his hand. So the father gave him the ring to carry, but not to wear. And so that it was fine for us right. to, to carry rings, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't wear them. Which, of course, is silly, right? I mean, of course, is absurd. But it just goes to this point of, you know, the, the, the Bible in a lot of ways can only say what our community tells us it can say. And, you know, that's where that community was. Yeah. And one of the things that strikes me is I can look back on that text. I think we can all look back on that story and, like you're saying, see the absurdity that's happening, right? Um, and at the same time, recognize that what's running in that community is a view of orthodoxy, right? What is orthodox? Yeah. Um, and now it brings us to questions when we look at the cultural moment we're in sure. of um, what is orthodoxy maintaining and how does that influence um, the way that voices can speak into predominantly uniform communities. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think the, the real power of what a, a lens of interpretation, you know, the, the way in which we interpret something, it's real power lies in us not knowing we believe that just assuming that it's true and not even considering the possibility that something else might be true. Mm. Like, mm. I, I think the, there are the things that we believe and we know we believe them. And we know they are beliefs. And then there are things that we believe and we don't even know we believe them. We just assume that it's real, that it's reality itself, right? They're so basic that we never question them. We never, we never consider them as something to be judged, to be critiqued. And a community's real power is, lies there. Like, what has it convinced you of so deeply that you would never even think that it's something that might be questioned? Or questionable and that I, I don't know how that ever changes unless you experience some kind of estrangement from that community 
usually through some kind of deep pain you know where you you experience something that alienates from you from that community and suddenly when you're alienated from it you're made aware that there are worlds outside of that world you inhabited right that there are other communities who don't share those same deep convictions those same profound assumptions and everything everything changes then but i don't know how you get there without a lot of pain uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's possible, but I, I don't know how exactly. I, I, so to, not, not to cut you off, but I mean, I think that that is the same place at which like racial prejudice and sexual pre kind of prejudice works, right? Our, our assumptions about about men's and women's roles and what it means to be a person and our, our assumptions about race, they're usually, most of them are so deep we don't even know that they're there to be questioned, right? Until something forces us to question it. Yeah, and when we, when we look at that and we try and determine what's actualizing the imagination that makes those readings possible, like you're saying, it's so difficult to see. Um, can you speak to ways that you've seen um, those underlying imaginations shift for yourself mm -hmm. uh, in the communities you grew up with? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> honestly, I think most of those shifts have happened for me in places I couldn't have anticipated, right? At times, I couldn't have anticipated mm. it. Yeah. Right. And this is one of the reasons that I, I think that a lot of times, you know, there's that famous line, the Emily Dickinson poem, tell the truth and tell it slant. I think there's, this is why I think most of the time when we're dealing with deep issues, like, like the, the issues tied to race and sexism, racism and sexism, we we're only going to be able to change those things in our own lives and in the lives of other people if we come at them indirectly because i think direct confrontation is just going to be misread as something else right because it's not again these assumptions are so deeply held that they're not held as beliefs they're not held as something that could be questioned you know th these things are unquestionably true and they're entangled with things that we love. And so I, I think that, you know, for me, it's been, you know, an, an example, here's, here's, here's an example of what I mean. So years ago, I, I watched this movie. It's been more than 20 years now. I watched this movie, a Matthew McConaughey movie, and it was called Frailty. Uh, Powers Booth was in it and uh, Matthew McConaughey, and I can't remember who else. And it was pretty pretty lame movie but the, the concept was interesting the concept was that Matthew McConaughey had received this call from God to kill demons who were in the world but these demons looked and acted exactly like human beings they weren't human beings but they looked and acted exactly like them hmm. and they died exactly like human beings like hmm. they bled they you know cried out for mercy I mean and the only reason that he could tell the difference is that God gave him this revelation, Matthew McConaughey, this revelation that these are not people, these are demons, and they need to be killed. Again, it's just a you know kind of typical horror movie with a little bit of a high concept. And, and yet when I was watching that movie, I had this realization that that's what's happening like with the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? When God tells Abraham, you know, go and kill Isaac. I mean, there's no authority Abraham can appeal to to make that reasonable to anyone else. I mean, he just has to say, God told me to do it, mm, right? Yeah. And this is long before I'd read Kierkegaard or anyone else, like right, about the Abraham and Isaac story. And, and slowly, pieces started to fall into place for me that ultimately our sense of right and wrong, like if we keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it back, Ultimately, we are saying something like we believe God is calling us to do this, that this is God's requirement on us, that there's and eventually what I came to realize years later is that what I was intuiting in that moment, what I was sensing in that moment 
is that there's no morality that's so clearly reasonable that every reasonable person will agree to it. Right? That there, there is a way in which the it's either revealed to us or it isn't revealed to us. Right? And of course, the movie is exploring, is this truly revealed to him or is he a psychopath using the name of God to kill people? And I won't spoil it for those who want to hunt the movie down. But <laughs> the... Yeah, I mean, so I, I think that most of us, if I, if, I could, if I could cut to this quick, I think most of us believe, or want to believe at least, that we can always kind of give a reason for whatever we're doing and that other people of goodwill, once they hear our reason, they'll see it the same way, right? And I think that's just flatly wrong. I, just, I don't think that's how the world works, and, I, and I, I, we could get into why, but I, I think that the facts are that the truth just doesn't reveal itself in those ways. You know, the, the famous line from our founding father's documents about, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You know, I, mm, I, I just don't yeah. think that's the nature of truth. I don't think truth is self-evident, and I don't think that assuming that it is leads us to good places now don't mishear me i mean i don't think we should kind of reject rational discourse i don't think we should reject conversation right, i don't right. think that you know the truth is something so hidden that we could never discuss it but i do think that the truth can be experienced in so many different ways and here i'm talking about the truth of everything right the truth of natural experience the truth of religious experience, I mean, fill in the blank, uh, the, it's always going to allow for differences. It's always going to allow for you to see it one way and me to see it another. And there's a kind of deep radical diversity that I think we're afraid of and shouldn't be. Yeah. And with the, um, you know, with that move of trying to, um, trying to press into the way that certain readings that we have, um, you know, privilege a privilege, a kind of uh, engagement with biblical texts that maybe justify the oppression that we uh, participate in. Um, I think of stories like the, the Phineas story. I remember at a youth camp, right. Where, you have the Phineas story and he takes a spear and he puts it through the people in the altar. And it's this great youth camp story because, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's like a movie in many ways. And yeah, certainly the details are sensationalized in that story. Or there's, there's the other one when they go in at night and they hit the tent peg through, through yeah. the head. Right. You have yeah. these stories that are really, um, they're sensational sensationalized and they, are used in these youth camp settings to say, look, the Bible is relevant and it's better than Hollywood, but yeah, it's just yeah. doubling down on a certain kind of uh, motif in the text that if we ever stopped in questions, like that really didn't do much other than provide entertainment and then radicalize into a certain kind of, uh, I think violence might be too too hard a word. I, I'm not sure which word to use there, but radicalize into a certain way of being Christian that immediately sets you up against someone else. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I think, and and tragically, those stories that you mentioned, both the the, the story of Jael who who kills Sisera by driving the nail through his head, and the, the story from Numbers where, you know, he, Phineas acts to avenge the name of God and the character of God by killing this man and in, in his Gentile, this Jewish man and his Gentile consort. He, both of those stories in the Bible, like when you actually read them, those stories are, are subverting themselves. They're actually calling us to question the violence. Let me, let me give you an example of what I mean. So like in the story of Sisera, right? So Sisera is this mighty king who comes against Israel, but Deborah and Barak are gifted by God to lead Israel in this battle. And 
miraculously, they defeat this army that is, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, favored to win. Right, that this the Israel is greatly outnumbered and outman, you know, outmanned and outgunned, we might say, and yet they win the battle anyway. And Sisera flees for his life. He's not killed in the battle, but the the the, the foreign general, you know, is fleeing for his life, and he comes to the tent of this woman, Yale, and she takes him in, gives him milk and honey, and he falls asleep in her tent, and then she kills him. She drives the tent peg through his head. And then after that, you get this song of victory, right, where, you know, Israel Israel is triumph. But then the story ends with a scene from Sisera's mother and wife, I think, or mother and sister, I can't remember off the top of my head. But they're looking through the window, waiting for him to return home, right? Now, th there's a kind of uh, literary ambiguity in that, right, like in that as a story, it, it leaves us thinking about Sisera, right? We don't end. So like I think in the, in the kind of Hollywood version, we would have ended at the, at the song. We would have ended with the victory and the death of the general. And we would have, the credits would have rolled and we'd have gone home, right? But in, but in biblical narrative, it doesn't end there, right? You, you get this next moment in which you're forced to think about your enemies wife and mother and their grief which undercuts any sense of confidence that you know god loves us and hates them right yeah and and that is an example of i i think it happens in almost every story in scripture where you get some detail that works back on you as a reader that is meant to bring you to a place of questioning your assumptions. It's meant to make you wonder whether or not you've understood this story rightly. Right. And unfortunately you, we don't read them that way. Right. And you, you already talked about the story. You touched on it. It's probably one of the more famous stories with Abraham and sacrificing um, Isaac. Can you talk about how that reads back on us? Um, after that event, because there's certainly so much more that happens, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so again, with the way we tell the story, right, it, it's, I mean, part of our problem, if I could just comment for a moment, I think part of the problem is in most of our circles in kind of contemporary American Christianity, we just are, we're bad readers. We're bad readers of texts and, and bad readers of films and we we just we don't we don't have the kind of training to read for the kind of nuance and complexity that these biblical stories actually have right and i used to say that we've vegetailed all those stories but now the vegetales creator has come out with some personal commentary on the race issues that that makes me think he he might have been more aware of those nuances than than we realized or than I realized. So I, I won't say yeah. that, but we, we have, I think, maybe I could say we've Sunday schooled these stories. We, we've flanagraphed everything. We flanagraphed <laughs> everything. Yeah, exactly. Right. We've made everything. And that's a flanograph is perfect in that we've made it all two dimensional and, and, and undramatic. And, yeah. and we've in the process, we've lost touch with the art of these stories. Like and we, the story only moves forward as we manipulate as we it, it, as we, we handle manipulate it. it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we, and we are speaking for the characters, right. Instead of letting them speak for themselves. Right. I mean, it, it's, I think that's exactly the right metaphor for our problem in that we, you know, I just heard a, a pastor yesterday, um, his church had, they had, they'd gotten together and COVID had a COVID outbreak and he was trying to speak to that issue. And, to speak to it, he appealed to this story of Moses in the wilderness. But instead of kind of letting the story of Moses' failures like work back on him, he just read his own sense of certainty about his good motives into Moses' story, right? And assumed he was like, well, Moses made mistakes, but he, he always had the best intentions. But if you read the stories themselves, the biblical stories, I mean, they're much, again, they're much more nuanced than that. They're much, they're much more honest than that about 
the characters that we've come to idolize. And so, and so it is with Abraham. So when in the, in the flow of Genesis, like if you read Genesis like a novel and you were a good reader of novels, when you get to the story of Abraham being told to take his son Isaac and kill him, you're, you would be freaked out for lots of reasons. One is because Abraham has shown himself to be a man who argues with God. You know, about, say, Sodom and Gomorrah that is destroyed a few chapters previously, where God says, you know, I'm going to destroy this city. And Abraham says, wait a minute, you're the judge of all the earth, and you, you need me to tell you about right and wrong. Well, you, you can't just destroy the city. You have to you have to see if there's any way to save it. And so Abraham, you know, begins to bargain with God for, for 50, for 40, 5, for 40, all the way down to for 10, will you spare the city? And... And so one of the things that would strike us right away is why isn't he arguing with God about his son being sacrificed? Yeah, right? yeah, he's done it back there, but he's not doing it in this moment, right? Right, so right away, if we're good readers, we assume, okay, something's up. Like, why would he not, right? Another thing is we're, the text tells us that God asked him because he wanted to see if Abraham was faithful. God tested Abraham. But again, if we're good readers of the text, we know that God has already said again and again on Abraham's behalf to other people that Abraham is faithful and that he knows what's going to happen through Abraham's lineage. Right. So when he calls Abraham in the very beginning of the story, it's through you I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. Not, I want to, we'll see if you're up to it. Um, I hope that's what comes from this. I mean, it's a promise, right? You're, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. And he's already promised him that Isaac's descendants will be like the stars and like the sand of the sea. So it makes no sense for God to be testing him. Right? So just like it makes no sense for Abraham to not argue with God, it makes no sense for God to test Abraham, he clearly already knows who Abraham is. And besides, he's clearly the God who brings about what he promises anyway. Right? And, and yet somehow we right, read right past those troubling, those kind of wrinkles in the story that should make us pause. You know, and, and then we either just turn it into, you know, some kind of horror story. Or we simply say, well, that's how it is, right? I mean, God tells us to do it, and so we do it. And this is, this is not just the case for, you know, Joe Average down the street in a small church. I mean, even Thomas Aquinas, great medieval Catholic theologian, makes this very mistake. I mean, when he's talking about this passage, he says, you know, this seems to be wrong. It seems to be wrong for Abraham to kill his son, but it can't be because God is the one who decides what is right and wrong. And if God has said to do it, then it, it can't, therefore can't be wrong because God's the one who decides what is right and wrong. Mm, yeah. and it's, it's horrifically simplistic, right? And it's simplistic in a way that not only betrays the nature of our conscience, our own sense of horror at the thought of a man killing his son in God's name. But it betrays the text itself, right? The text is much more careful than that. And, of course, you know, it gets worse from there. I mean, Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain. He puts him on the altar. Abraham seems to be ready to do it. The angel of the Lord intervenes, and he doesn't do it. But then we never hear from Isaac again. Mm, and the text, yeah. again, is pretty careful to tell us that Abraham returns home with the servants, but Isaac is not mentioned. And the next time we see Isaac, he's living in a different place from Abraham, living in his mother's tent. And I, Abraham and Isaac never speak again in, in, the, in the text. Like there's never right, any right. engagement between the two of them, right? And, and so, I, you know, it looks like the story wants us to think that Isaac doesn't come down from the altar. In fact, we're not even told that he's not still tied to the altar. We don't even know where he is. Like mm. the angel of the Lord yeah. begins to speak to Abraham and Abraham turns his attention to God and Isaac is just forgotten and is never mentioned again in the story, in, in that passage. And I, I think that this is designed 
that this is part of the design of the biblical narratives. They are meant to trouble us. They are meant to force us to reflection, to their, I would say they're puzzles, but I don't mean it in some trivial way. Puzzles is a little too um, gamey. I don't, mm, I don't mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't think the biblical texts are games, but I do think that they are, they are meant, many of them, maybe, maybe not all of them, but many of them, and in, in a, some sense, the whole of them, they're meant to force us into a place of reflection and critical reflection, doubt, uncertainty. And we're reading them in the exact opposite way too much of the time, right? We're reading them for certainty. We're reading them in ways that reinforce what we already believe. We're reading them in ways that to win arguments, right? We're, we're, we're using these texts to prove that we're right. And I think that is just an incredible violation of not only what it means to be human and not only what is necessary to live in community, it's a violation of the nature of the text God has given us, right? That what part of what we mean when we say scripture is inspired is that the texts have been made a certain way to do certain things. And we're using them too often in ways that violate that. Yeah. Wow. There's so much in the story. Um, and just in everything you've said about how, the the text um, is meant to work on us and even though you have people like Aquinas who are reading the text more robustly than most of us yeah, probably any of us like uh, yeah. I, I think we oftentimes undersell um, just how well people knew the text in these early church fathers oh, and in, in the yeah. ancient world right like there's just this they knew the Bible difference. so much better than we do. Yeah, we cannot. It's one of those things that it's it's obvious if you think about it, but we don't think about it. I mean, we're we have far greater literacy than they had in the ancient or medieval world. Yeah, but the average person is able to read the text, but with nowhere near the skill of someone like Aquinas or or just the mastery of the text itself. I, I mean. I don't remember if I, if you had this class with me, but whenever I taught medieval Christianity or whenever I teach it, one of the things I do is give the students an, an assignment. It's a Thomas, it's a sermon, the, the first sermon by Thomas Aquinas, which is a sermon about the Bible in hmm. which he quotes every, he quotes from every book of the Bible. Wow. And it's the Catholic, not the Pro Protestant Bible. So it has many more texts than, in, you know, what we call apocryphal texts right. are included. And he not only quotes from them, but he quotes from them in a way that arranges a system, right? So in this, in a sermon, again, we're not talking about like a, a textbook, right? Or, or a treatise, like in a sermon, he makes reference from memory to every book of the Bible, right? And so remarkable. Yeah. And, and we have nothing like that right now, right? right? I mean, our, our, we're not, I couldn't pull that off. I, I, I could probably name every book of the Bible in a sermon, but I couldn't on the fly quote from every book of the Bible and do it in a way that shows how the Bible is schematized, right? I mean, so he has a whole theology of history that he uses the, the Bible to, you know, to, to, to prove. But again, that one that should humble us, right? That should humble us and remind us that we just because we're familiar with the Bible doesn't mean we know it very well. And it certainly doesn't mean that we mastered it in any sense, but it also should humble us. And that even people who have mastered it in the, in that they, they have great mastery of what the texts say can still oversimplify what the texts are doing mm. right? and, and miss the, the artfulness of the story. I think that I think posture that... that you're talking about, which for me was uh, handed to really privilege and emphasize becoming masters of being able to use the Bible, to quote the Bible, to read, discern, and apply, and yeah. do it in ways that fit, um, you know, a, a rural Canadian <laughs> context. Um, we've done it in ways that cut across how the Bible um, and the word of God can, 
be a liberative word to people who aren't in that context. Uh, That's right. And it, it, I mean, I want to say in some sense it works in that you can grow a church that way. You can, um, you can convince some people that you're right that way, but in the long run it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of the character of the community that produces and what that does to our consciences what that does to the way that we apprehend the world, what that does, again, to the texts themselves. It's, it's such a betrayal of what the texts themselves are up to, what they're actually saying. And I think there's a sim... I, I don't want to draw that too neat a parallel, but I think there's a way in which... If you read the Bible that way, the way you're describing, right, that 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 you experienced growing up in in Canada, I think that what you end up doing is being the kind of person who, well, I mean, you want to win arguments, and you think that the way to get people into the faith is by having some kind of knockdown for every one of their questions, right? And that the Bible is this resource that you use to win those arguments, right? And I've started like, to refer to that as like clap back theology. Right? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> exactly. And the Bible then is is kind of your your arsenal for for all of the, you know, all of the victories you need to win to finally defeat someone into salvation right into into recognizing that you're right and that once they've recognized that then that then they are saved as you are right and i i think that is one that's just a manifestation of 15th and 16th century colonial philosophy that has taken over our christianity where we're thinking like conquerors we're thinking like colonial powers who all we have to do is have greater power, greater mm. might. Yeah. And we can do whatever we want. Right. And that ideology has gotten into our bloodstream. Right. And now it's reshaped mm. the way we practice Christianity. Right. And so the, you know, I, I can, I can remember, you know, the churches I grew up in, they were virulently anti Catholic. And one of the things they would say about Catholics is that, you know, Catholics think you can convert people with a sword. Right. That you could come to the Americas and threaten people with death. And if they converted to Christianity, that counted. But of course we did the exact same thing, except we threatened eternal death, right? Either believe what we believe or you're going to burn in hell forever. Mm. It's the same violence. We're just using invisible weapons to do it, right? We're using intellectual weapons and emotional weapons to do it, but it's the same, the same, pattern and it's a pattern that comes to us from 15th and 16th century European colonial powers I mean that's the and in some ways of course they're borrowing it from the ways in which the church had taken on Roman power I mean it's a complicated history but it's you know it's tragic it's tragic that we think that that actually is what we're required to do and we don't see the violence in it so when we hear and when we're exhorted to um and when we encounter people who say something like this is the biblical way or the biblical view on fill in the blank uh, whatever that is how does that fit into um that historical framework you've just sketched out and how, how do those things interact yeah, well, I mean, I'll put it bluntly. I mean, if anyone who can say that can only say that because they're ignorant or because they're trying to claim that they're right and everybody else is wrong. So mm -hmm. either they don't know history or they don't they know history and they don't care that their reading is different from everyone else's. Right. But you can't know the history of Jewish and Christian readings of scripture and claim that there is a biblical view of X. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example, right? So often in my circles, right, there's talk about the biblical view of marriage, but that's silly if you know the Bible and if you know history, 
right? Mm. You could say something like there is um, a, a broad tradition of affirming marriage, but it's a complicated tradition, and it's a long history with lots of nuance. So one of the, way, the ways that I would illustrate this is in, in the Old Testament scripture, for instance, women, in terms of the text itself, women are, are often spoken of as property. Mm, yeah. So like in the Ten Commandments, it's not an accident that when we're told not to covet, one of the things we're told not to covet is the neighbor's wife. Mm, yeah. Right? Because she belongs to him. Right. Also in, in Old Testament scripture, there's nothing like, so like I was brought up on, the, on the, the idea of a Christian sexual ethic that says no sex outside of marriage, period. Mm, yeah. And that the Bible teaches that. Right. But that sex inside of marriage, pretty much anything goes. Right? Mm, yeah. And that the Bible also teaches that, right? The, the marriage bed is undefiled, all that stuff. Well, all of that's wrong, right? That's not actually what the Bible teaches, right? There's, there's, you know, Abraham had many wives, right? And hmm. so did David, right? Yeah. And it's not a, so there's, there's polygamy in, in the tradition. And even in the New Testament, it looks like when Paul is talking about, or whoever wrote First and Second Timothy and Titus is talking about church leadership, and the, the qualification for a bishop is to be the husband of one wife, that's almost certainly, well, at least it's possible, I should say. I don't want to overstate the case. But it's, it's possible that what's being said is not not divorced, but not married to more than one woman, right? That the, the bishop should have one wife. And again, the reason is almost certainly not theological. It's practical hmm. Hmm. that... And we see this, for instance, in First Corinthians, where Paul is talking about marriage, and he says, I wish you wouldn't marry. My, my goal would be for you not to marry. But if you do marry, you haven't necessarily sinned, but just know that if you are, cons if you are married, you will not be about the work of the Lord. You will be about, worried about taking care of your family. So what looks like it looks like is happening in the pastoral letters is he saying a bishop should be the husband of no more than one wife because otherwise he wouldn't have time to do the work of a bishop. Hmm. Like he wouldn't have time to, to carry it out. And whether or not that's what the text, what the writer of Timothy means, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty clear that that was the concern because the early church pretty quickly, at least in many parts of the world, moves to arguing that bishops shouldn't be married at all for that reason. Hmm. Right, yeah. that you you just can't do the work required of you if you have a family to worry about. Now, there's diversity in the Christian tradition on that point too. Right? Is celibacy required for priests and bishops, and so on? Right, but it causes us to. Right, I mean, I could go on, I guess, but the point is, there's complication there, and my favorite example of this is in a lot of early church fathers, they they condemn sex inside of marriage for the sake of pleasure only. Mm, yeah. So they'll, you know, you have someone like John Chrysostom saying, lust is worse inside of marriage than out because you're violating the integrity of a sacred institution, marriage. Yeah. You're yeah. meant to be married in order to overcome lust. The goal of marriage is to to end lust not to fulfill it and so when we when people in my circles today talk about the christian sexual ethic i mean they're nine times out of ten they're just saying it because they don't actually know what the bible says and they don't actually know what the history says which is much more complicated and much more contradictory than they're ready to allow but Sometimes people do know that and insist it anyway, but in those cases, what they're doing is insisting that they're right and everyone else is wrong. Mm. That's I a think, different case. Yeah. And I think one thing that we are trying to do in this course is we started by looking at how um, there's over, what, 2.5 billion plus Christians in the world. And we started with the premise to say, do we think everyone believes the exact same thing? Right. And if about they, anything about anything yeah. and then if they don't 
why do different Christians do what they do? And we're not trying to, in this class, necessarily say, you need to believe this to be a Christian. We're trying to do a survey of different Christian expressions and say, look at the variety within yeah. this tent. Yeah. And it's an open tent. Uh, it's one that in some in in some areas it seems like people walk under the tent and other people will leave and at the same time we're trying to hold on to what faith looks like as people who continually live in this tension what does it mean to be a christian and believe different things than other christians who say i'm a christian yeah that's right yeah and and i i don't think i mean in the kind of facile flattened world in which a lot of us live at least a lot of the people I know live, you know, everything is, is binary. Everything is either, either this or that, right? You're, mm, yeah. you're yeah. either re Republican or Democrat. You're either progressive or conservative. You're, you either believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible or, you know, it's, it's all coded binary language. And I don't think that that can ever be true to the, to the real, flourishing of human life i mean I, I think it's the world's just not that kind of place and reality just doesn't reality is not what we want to make it no matter how hard we try to make it what we need we think we need reality is always going to push back on us i think and mm. the reality is you know there, there's here's an example there's a there's a little story by william golding who wrote the lord of the flies most famously but it's a little essay about going home and it, it, he's an elderly man reflecting on his experiences as a youth. And in it, he talks about how he, there was a, and he was in high school and there was this girl that he was really hot for. And he finally got her on a date, but she was conservative Catholic and he wants to kiss her, but she won't let him kiss her because he's not Catholic. And, He's, you know, he's trying to argue with her right in the back seat of the car to try to get his kiss and keeps pushing her on. How do you know Catholics are right? I mean, how do you know that I'm not a Christian too, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm Protestant, but how do you know? I, why doesn't that count? Mm -hmm. And she says, she throws out some number. I don't remember what the number was at the time, but there are so many Christians in the world, Catholics in the world, they can't all be wrong. And he came right back with an even greater number of believers who aren't Catholic and says, but, you know, look at this greater number. They can't all be wrong, too. Yeah, yeah. And she, she in the story, she jumps out of the car and runs away af afraid. And I think about that story a lot because I, th I think there's a way in which, obviously, it's a silly claim, right, the idea that, the majority of people believe this, so it must be true, or the majority of people in my community believe it, so it must be true. But what interests me about that is not the silliness of the thinking, but how deeply rooted it goes. Like, the, she leaps out of the car and runs away afraid. Mm. Right? She, she's, her, her beliefs, which are seemingly superficial and obviously silly, have roots in her heart that are, that are touching all of her worst fears mm. and all of her, yeah, all, all that she most is afraid to think about. And, and one of the things I think about any of this, and this is why I think conversations about scripture are so hard for people. And I'm, I'm sure it will be hard for even people in your class that we can have a conversation, but a lot of the things that you and I are going to say if we point out the silliness or the superficiality or the, even just the incompleteness of an argument, that's one thing. But we have to remember that that has roots that run all the way down into our, our subconscious, into the heart of our hearts. Mm. And that's what's really going on, right? Like we're, we're, we can't be confused about a lot of what looks like theological debate on the surface Mm. isn't really theological debate at all. Yeah. It's this deep psychological conflict of of unnamed and maybe unnameable fears mm. that have somehow become entangled with this superficial belief about 
about the Bible or Christianity or my denomination or, or whatever. Yeah. And that's why, to come back to something I said a long time ago in this conversation, that's why I think we have to come at a lot of this indirectly. Mm. Because if we, we're going to get reactions from people that don't fit, they're not fitted to the conversation because they're actually awakening in the depths of people Again, primal fears. It's confronting, right? And yeah, absolutely. It, I think in many ways that's where, um, you know, as we look at even the work you've done, sanctifying interpretation, one of the big themes in this book and in this approach to scripture is that we're not sanctified um, or we're not saved from having to discern. Right. We're saved through the actual process of Work wrestling yeah. and working to say, how can this text be true of a God that we say is good, of a yeah. God that we say is loving? Like, Absolutely. how do we reconcile these texts that say, God commands you to do this act that by any standard here, like in a world court, we'd say that is condemnable. That's not yeah. good. Yeah. But we say God is good. How do we reconcile that? Yeah. And again, we're not saved from the process of having to, to discern what this means. Uh, we're saved through the process of wrestling through uh, That's right. seeing, being able to see where is God present in these stories. Absolutely. Uh, and so um, one final question for us before we log off. Um, how do you then decide on a particular interpretation, whether or not that's true or faithful, whatever word we want to use there. I know we talked about that at the very beginning um, as saying that's there's a lot of stuff to, to unpack there. But if we were to try and give a handle on what does that look like, um, how do we start making that move towards more faithful readings, more truer readings? Yeah, I mean, I, I think St. Augustine, early church father, gets this right. So he, he has a a work on Christian teaching, which he talks about reading scripture. And he says right up front, you know, the true measure of a good reading is that it brings about love for God and love for neighbor. And he says, you might, he, these are my words, not his, but he essentially, he gives the example of like, we, we agree we're going to meet at a certain place. And we get there, we meet, and you meet me on time. But once we we're there and we're talking, we look back and realize that you you took a harder road than you needed to take. You got there, and that's what matters. But we look back and realize, hey, you you actually could have gotten here much more easily, much quicker. So next time you come, come this other way, right? So he says that there are ways of reading that are technically incorrect. But as long as they get you to love of God and love of neighbor, they work. That's what matters. That's what really matters. But there are ways in which, so again, these are my words, not his, but essentially what he's saying is that there are right and wrong readings, and then there are true and false ones. Right? Mm. So right and wrong would mean something like you followed the rules of interpretation or you didn't. True or false would mean you love God and love neighbor more or not. So if it's false... It, it moves you away from loving God, away from loving your neighbor. It makes you destructive and hateful and um, oppressive. A true reading makes you like Christ, right? It, it makes you um, gentle and wise and all the ways that he is. So what he's saying then is you could have wrong readings that bring about true results. Right? Like you could read the wrong way, mm. but read and still end up becoming more like Christ. And he says that would be better than reading the right way in terms of literary rule of, of interpretation and ending up with the wrong, you know, with false formation, like being, being made less faithful. So I, I, I think the key is, I, I don't, here's, here's the, the caveat though. What he would have said makes a right reading I don't, I would not agree with. Mm, okay. I do agree with what he says is a true reading. Yeah. Right. So I yeah. think over time, what counts as a right and a wrong reading will shift depending on your culture, depending mm. on your time, 
depending on your skill, right? Whether you're reading, yeah. you know, as you know, a, a kid or as an adult, whether you're reading as a professor in a discipline or you're reading as, you know, a, a layperson. I mean, what counts as right and wrong interpretation is much fuzzier, fuzzier than I think he he admits. But ultimately, he's right. What matters in the end is, do I become like Christ or not? Mm. It, is that what's happening to me through my reading? Yeah. And I don't think ultimately I can answer that question for myself. Wow. Like I won't know if I'm becoming more like Christ. Other people around me probably will, though. Yeah. Uh, my wife and kids, first and foremost, they'll probably be the ones, the first to recognize whether or not that way of reading is actually bringing that about. So, yeah. Does that, does that make sense? It does. And I think that's a great place to land. It makes me think of how um, I've heard Willie Jennings talk about um, in the New Testament, when Jesus is interacting with his disciples, there's questions that we read as him just posing to, this, to the disciples to move the story. There's questions that Jesus asks yes. the disciples. But if we only ever see them as those questions that move the story along, we never actually take in that these are questions posed to the disciples that we as readers are supposed to read and allow it to make us more disciple. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so if we never allow the readings of the Bible to, again, read us in ways that cause us to become disciples, we're missing the point of the whole story. We're missing absolutely. his whole interaction with the disciples. There's so many questions where it turns inward to, the group, the, the group of followers. And it's almost like a commentary on if we claim to be followers of Christ, how do we answer those same questions? Like, don't let it just move narratively. Don't keep it out here. Let it come here and challenge. That's right. I mean, to go back to the flannel graph analogy you brought up, I mean, at some point, the characters have to live. Yeah. Like the, 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 it has to have an integrity of its own that I don't manipulate. I'm not placing them. I'm not speaking for them. I'm, I'm listening. Mm. I'm in a, I'm in a posture of, and, and this, and I would say I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. So Rowan Williams has this essay on the Bible and authority. It was a lecture that he gave and he, he makes this, which I think is the fundamental issue when you're talking about authority. Mm. He says the authoritative reading of the Bible is the authority is the reading of the church gathered at the table of the Lord hearing the gospel read hmm. that the the personal reading not not private but personal reading devotional reading is not the authoritative reading the authoritative reading is the ecclesial reading the the church's reading in response to the thanksgiving of the of communion I think that's exactly right. I think I think that what that means then is the the fundamental posture of interpretation is listening, right? So th and this is tricky, and we, yeah. we're probably opening up a whole other can of worms, as they say. But the or Pandora's box. But there's a way in which reading completes the act of writing. There's a way in which reading is active. You know, I'm making meaning. Right. Uh, story yields multiple possibilities. And I, I have to decide on one or several of those. I have to say, I think the story is saying this. Yeah. And yet the fundamental posture, I think of the Christian reader is, is listening. What do the, what does this text have to say to me? Not what do I have to say about this text. Mm. And if we ever get that twisted, right? If we ever think the text is there to serve us in the sense that, you know, it's a resource for me to win the arguments I want to win. Yeah. We're lost already, right? Mm. It, it needs to be, the fundamental posture needs to be, the Bible is authoritative. Therefore, my reading of the Bible is not, mm. right? Precisely because I believe the Bible is God's word precisely because I believe the Bible is authoritative. I don't assume that I can do whatever I want with it. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that 
if that's not right, nothing else will, will be right. Mm. Thank you for that finally helpful distinction to end with. I think it's so great to make that distinction between the Bible as the word of God and our interpretations or reading of it that are um, looking at different facets of that true word. It's not that we're saying, and I don't hear you saying that the Bible isn't true. Not at we're just all. questioning is the way that I'm reading and is the way that a certain tradition has given me lens to read the truest way to exactly. read this true thing. Um, yeah. And are we ultimately then grasped by the truth to become truer people, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just end with the reading itself, which Absolutely. I think is so much that you've been talking about. That's it's exactly right. the formation. And so thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Yeah, thank you. This has been a joy. And um, friends, if you so desire, get that pre-order into double digits. <laughs> That's right. Let's, 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 try try that. let's try and get from nine to 10. <laughs> listen, 10 would be a dream. I would love that. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And uh, friends, we will um, use this as a way to reflect on in your journal entries at the end of the week. And uh, I'll see you back in class tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.